March Madness is a big deal. It's almost as big as the Super Bowl. This annual college basketball tournament generates almost a billion dollars a year. But the players on the court don't take home any of that profit. So who actually profits? Companies, colleges, and the National Collegiate Athletic Association, or NCAA. Once you start looking at the numbers is where you, you really notice that you're being exploited. And now critics are calling for change. My ideal structure would start with the abolition of the NCAA, burn it to the ground and salt the earth. We take a closer look at how college sports became this billion dollar industry for the NCAA, find out where that money goes, and whether student athletes should get paid for their labor. March Madness is back after a one-year hiatus because of COVID-19. It's an NCAA tournament where 68 college basketball teams compete to be crowned national champions. And it makes mad money. College sports are a $14 billion industry. The NCAA itself makes more than a billion dollars annually. More than $900 million of that money comes from three weeks of March Madness. These numbers are all pre-COVID, of course. 2021's will be a little different. So who gets a piece of that pie? The NCAA says the money is split between operating costs, NCAA colleges, regional conferences, and student-athlete scholarships. A single coach can make millions in a year, while players' take-home pay is zero dollars. The NCAA is a cartel and it serves coaches, it serves athletic directors, it serves conference chairmen, it serves people who make millions of dollars off the collegiate system. The people it doesn't serve are the people that it mentions in their very mission statement, and those are the players themselves. The NCAA says that's because these players are so-called amateurs. A bit more on that later. Here's former NBA player Itan Thomas. He played basketball in college. I have a lot of school pride. You know, I'm wearing my Syracuse hoodie right now. We saw the number that they made just off of March Madness. We was like, whoa, this is how much they made? But again, that was just from March Madness alone. The president of the NCAA says there's not enough money to go around. It's this interesting irony that everybody thinks schools are playing sports because they make so much money at it, when in reality, they virtually all lose money at it. Although college sports has often involved big money, what has changed is the scale of profit. In the 1950s, the rise of television meant the NCAA began profiting off of broadcast deals. Now, the NCAA sells broadcast rights averaging about $770 million a year for March Madness alone. There's also lots of money in sponsorships and brand endorsement deals for universities. It started in the 1970s, when Nike started paying college basketball coaches thousands of dollars to have their players wear their sneakers. Now Nike, Adidas, and Under Armour pay hundreds of millions a year to colleges for shoe and apparel sponsorships. So why shouldn't the student athletes who are doing the actual work get paid? The NCAA says it doesn't have to pay student athletes because they're so-called amateurs, not professionals. What does being an amateur really mean? The NCAA says amateur student athletes at the college level should be motivated by physical, mental, and social benefits and protected from exploitation by professional and commercial enterprises. But is this definition outdated? And is the NCAA violating the second point itself? College sports used to be the refuge of the wealthy. It was wealthy white families that were playing football and playing basketball, and these were considered gentlemanly amateur pursuits. So how different are these students from professional players? They treat it like you're a professional in every single way, except for compensation. Every other way. Before NCAA athletes can play, they have to sign a form affirming their status as an amateur. Then they agree to follow a set of very strict rules. That includes rules against having an agent, receiving prize money in a competition, or promoting or endorsing any product or service. Why do young athletes accept these strict terms? I couldn't have gone to Syracuse University and paid for that. You know, my mother, single parent household teacher, you know, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, I wouldn't have been able to. While black men continue to be underrepresented among university students, 
They make up more than half of top college basketball and football teams. The issue with the NCAA and the compensation of athletes is not just about money, it's about justice. It's about fairness. The NCAA says it provides world-class resources and a huge platform for athletes aspiring to go pro. But only 1.2% of NCAA men's basketball players make it to the professional leagues. The number is even lower for women basketball players. The NCAA acknowledges these slim odds and emphasizes the value of education, but can student athletes have it all? The NCAA says that student athletes are students first and athletes second. But a 2011 lawsuit against the NCAA showed college basketball players averaged 40 hours a week on athletic activities. That's equivalent of a full-time work week. I was a business uh, major and I remember each coach at different times coming to me and saying, why are you killing yourself with these hard classes? We need you to really focus on basketball. It's really structured. You don't really have as much free time. I mean, you see other kids, you know, just kind of playing frisbee, you know, in their off time and relaxing and chilling on the quad. And we're like, no, we, we got to go to work. So it, it feels like an actual job. This is why some reject the term student athlete. They're athlete students because as soon as they go on campus, they are told what their priorities need to be. And that's sports first, academics second. And what's the value of their education? An investigation in 2014 found that at least one university had enrolled students in fake classes. But the NCAA refused to penalize the school for boosting athletes' GPAs because non-athletes had been enrolled in the course as well. Instead, the NCAA now offers funding that goes toward improving the academic performance of student athletes. They're treated like gods by their peers. They're able to get away with things that other students aren't able to get away with, and yet they're treated like property. The NCAA has previously said that the scholarships they offer athletes should be enough compensation. However, schools have the power to decide whether they reduce or revoke student athletes' aid. And students can lose their scholarships if they're injured. On top of that, students who accept money or incentives that haven't been approved by the NCAA are penalized. There's a lot of examples of athletes that are punished for violating the rules of the NCAA, like Chase Young, the player from Ohio State, who just wanted his family to come to see him play in a Rose Bowl game, and so they accepted money from a family friend. He was then punished by the NCAA and forced to sit out for several games. I also think of James Wiseman at Memphis. His family accepted money and he didn't even know about it. A majority of African Americans who participated in a nationwide poll are in favor of paying student athletes. The majority of college students polled were also in favor. Student athletes are slowly gaining more rights. The biggest challenges to the NCAA have come in the form of antitrust lawsuits, which target monopolies. Former UCLA basketball player Ed O'Bannon led a class action lawsuit after he was featured in a popular college basketball video game that he didn't get any money from. A $60 million settlement was approved in 2016, with the NCAA and Electronic Arts, the video game maker, ordered to pay Ed O'Bannon's attorneys. In 2020, the NCAA said that it would finally support allowing student athletes to receive compensation from third parties that use their name, image, and likeness. But that would come with some restrictions, and student athletes would still not be allowed to receive payment from their colleges or universities, even if their name, image, or likeness was being used by the institutions. The NCAA was supposed to vote on the proposed changes in early 2021, but indefinitely delayed the vote after recommendation from the Justice Department. Two-thirds of Americans polled strongly supported student-athletes profiting from their name, image, and likeness. Both red and blue states are now stepping in with their own legislation to empower student-athletes, instead of waiting for the NCAA to change its rules. It really changed the game as far as like what's possible for those players, their ability to uh, make money for their family and for themselves, their ability to extend their career. College football players attempted to organize a union at Northwestern University in 2015. Student athletes don't have a voice. They don't have a seat at the table. And while the National Labor Relations Board rejected this bid for unionization, the National College Players Association continues to challenge the NCAA even in Congress. I see student athletes organizing in a way that I didn't see before. 
Like, and also they have social media, so they could organize a little bit better. We didn't have social media. Imagine if like Muhammad Ali had a Twitter account or Instagram. That would have been amazing. Students are thinking about labor rights, economic percussions. What's left for them in a society in which so many of our, our rights and expectations of financial comfort are being wiped away through policy making? As long as there are sports fans, college sports, and athletes who aren't getting paid in college, this debate isn't going away anytime soon.